because I am the DC dude, so many people on a regular basis ask me, what do you think the most undervalued DC comics are? And quite frankly, there's a lot. I could probably give you like 200. But because I don't like talking about undervalued books, I'm only gonna give you 10. Speaking of undervalued DC keys, let's talk about the 20,000 subscriber giveaway in which you're gonna win Superboy Zero and Superboy 9. 20,000 subscribers, like and comment down below, you're gonna have a shot at winning that. Let's get this list started off with Underworld Unleashed number one from 1995. This is the first appearance of Neron, which is like a demon slash lord from hell. Kind of a cool first appearance cover, but maybe it might turn a couple people the wrong way with the art style. This was not a one-time villain. He played a major part in a lot of 90s arcs, but he continues to be in stories to this day and is one of the more powerful DC villains in the entirety of DC Comics. Just this past year, Mastodon released a song called Forged by Neron. Hell, he even made it into the CW. Of all the DC villains of what I would call a crisis caliber, this is one that absolutely is well known, yet you can get this in 50 cent bins or dollar bins. That's right. One theory I have is that it's a little too similar to an even bigger DC bad called Necron. Maybe that explains it, or maybe that causes some confusion. Who knows? Oh boy, this one is close to me. Swamp Thing, issue 90. First appearance of Tefe Holland, the daughter of Swamp Thing and Abby. One thing that makes this book tough is it was printed considerably less than some of the ones on this list. It's really tough. There's very few on the census. It's an all black spine. It's a really, really tricky book. Despite all these things, first major appearance, black spine, not many on the census, low print count. This is only like a one, two, three dollar book. Still, I have seen a couple recent sales that were like seven, eight dollars, but even if that was the fair market value of that thing, that's way too low, are you kidding me? Yeah, that, that's probably one of the most egregious ones on this list. Next up is the first Silver Age entry on this list, and it's with Showcase issue number 56, I believe from 1965. This is the first appearance, and I got my copy right here, of Psycho Pirate, Roger Hayden's version, which is the one that we know today. Now, Psycho Pirate did exist earlier than that, and I think one of the reasons it's so underrated is CGC actually just calls it the first Silver Age appearance of Psycho Pirate, when it should say the first appearance of Psycho Pirate, parentheses, Roger Hayden, because this is a whole different character than what was going on previously in the Golden Age. I wonder if that little tiny note in CGC makes people think it's maybe a more secondary appearance. This is a big book. Doesn't matter. You can still find a nice mid-grade copy for like 20, 30, maybe 40 bucks. Makes absolutely no sense. I don't, it doesn't make any sense. This one I got right here is mid to high grade and I got it for $25. That doesn't make any sense, but hey. Next up, we got Justice League number five from 1987. This is a now classic story of Batman getting absolutely fed up by Guy Gardner's big mouth, and he punches him, one-shots him right in the face. Blue Beetle's laughing the whole time, saying he one-shotted him. This panel not only says so much about Guy Gardner, it says so much about Batman, but it's become a parodied thing in the DC world, and we see it homaged many times after the fact. Whether it be Guy Gardner getting some revenge, or Hal Jordan getting a one-shot punch on Batman. You are not going to find this over a dollar. This is a total dollar bin book, maybe 50 cent, 25 cent book all day. Next time you're on a hunt and you find that one, grab it. It's fantastic read. Detective Comics 608, the first appearance of Anarchy. This is a huge Batman villain. Not as huge as Joker or Bane or Riddler, but this is a definitely notable, not C-list, not D-list Batman villain. 9.8 prices, it's like $100 to $120 9.8. That is very, very affordable for a 1989 notable, notable Batman key. One of the members of the rogues gallery, one of the most interesting characters, he had his own series a couple times. Makes no sense why that is only like a $5 to $10 book. I actually still find that one in like dollar bins. Someone, how is this possible? And it hurts because it's one of the best Batman villains there is. And what's weird is he's known and people know him, but they still, it's 
Five, ten bucks? Okay, you, if you're saying so. Next up is Green Lantern issue 149. This is the first appearance of Salak, which is the bookkeeper of Oa. He's also kind of the Spock-esque character. He's the rule enforcer that oftentimes they play with as the guy that's such a stickler, whereas Hal Jordan wants to go off and do this thing. He's always the one reprimanding him. Absolutely central character to the Green Lantern mythos. He's in the cartoon. He's in, like, most Green Lantern stories after 1982. He's probably probably going to be in the HBO show for all we know. I couldn't really see a reality in which he wouldn't be in the show. So why are you able to get this book for, ready, one dollar. This is one I always see in the back bins for like one, two dollars. Maybe I've seen it three bucks. I actually do have a 9.8 myself. It's one of my favorite books. CGC does not make mention on the notes. I wonder if CBCS does. I don't know. That could be another reason. A lot of people put a lot of weight into that little keynote section on a CGC certified slab. Is that causing the book to be so shy? That it's possible. But reality is I think just a lot of people maybe don't know. That should be a much bigger book. Next up we got Detective Comics 701. In addition to being such a fantastic cover, this tie-in to the legacy storyline had Batman Bruce Wayne finally fighting Bane again. Because if you remember, in Nightfall, when Bane breaks Bruce Wayne's back, Bruce Wayne is not the person who finally bests Bane. It's Jean-Paul Valley. Azrael kicks Bane's butt, never Bruce Wayne. So to this point in the story, Bruce Wayne still didn't hold a candle to Bane. This time in Detective Comics 701, they finally got their rematch and he does beat Bane. Here's the catch. Bane's not on any Venom in this issue. And come to think about it, and you can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, I can only think to this day of a couple times where Batman has actually fist to fist beaten Bane without the help of others. And I can only think of one time that he beats Bane when Bane is on Venom. And if you follow that storyline, it technically wasn't even a win because he was falling into line with Bane's plan. So Bruce Wayne versus Bane is to this day still pretty outmatched. But in 701, despite the lack of any Venom, he does beat Bane. That's freaking awesome. You can get it for 50 cents. Next up, Justice League of America, issue 193. It is the first appearance of the All-Star Squadron, and nobody knows it. Maybe it's because the fact that the cover is not particularly appealing or memorable in any sort of way. It is one of those ones where it highlights an image to the right, and then only on the side does it make mention of what's going on as a bonus, where it talks about the All-Star Squadron. Kind of similar to Captain Carrot's first appearance. I recently found three nice, gorgeous copies in the dollar bin, and all the recent sales seem to be hovering between one to five bucks. For the first appearance of All-Star Squadron? Really? All-Star Squadron issue number one usually gets like a 10 to $15 price tag, but this Justice League book, which is actually the first appearance of the All-Star Squadron, gets significantly less. No one knows it, man. No one knows it. Next up, we got another Green Lantern book. This one's Volume 3, Issue 74. This one is the first appearance of Graven, which is, I believe, the second or third son of Darkseid. And kind of like Neron as well, despite having a major arc in a lot of the Green Lantern comics of that time, despite the fact that he makes an appearance on a show. Again, we got another Dark Spine here, so you're not going to find hardly any on the uh, census for CBCS or CGC. It's the first appearance of Graven, and you can get it for a buck maybe even 50 cents. Now, before I give you my absolute number one, I am gonna give you a bonus one, uh, Detective Comics 457. It is an all black spine, which means it's really hard to find in that high grade. Despite that, really high grade copies, you can get them for 15, 20 bucks. What? Well, the first appearance of Leslie Tompkins and what I would consider one of the best Bronze Age covers of all time. Despite that, it is only a $15 or $20 book. That one makes absolutely no sense to me, but none of these really do. I'm gonna give you my last one here. It's another Silver Age one. And again, I don't like giving too many of these secrets away, but it's another showcase. Showcase issue number 60. It is the first Silver Age appearance of Spectre. 
but it is also the first appearance of Asmodus, which is one of Spectre's biggest arch rivals, made especially popular in the Ostrander series, which is amazing. I think maybe one of the reasons is possibly another fault with CGC's notes on the label. It says, first Silver Age appearance of Spectre, which is accurate. He had been missing for quite some time. This is his first time back in the Silver Age. But it says, first Silver Age appearance of Spectre and Asmodus. So it makes it look like it's the Silver Age appearance of Asmodus, but it is Asmodus's actual first appearance. I think everyone constantly just ignores the Asmodus thing and focuses on, oh, it's just, you know, it's the Silver Age appearance of Spectre. That's pretty cool, you know? No, there's, there's a couple notable things going on in this book which are getting overlooked. Not to mention, even if it was just the first Silver Age appearance of Spectre, that should be good enough to make this book a little higher than where it is. You can get this in a nice mid-grade, maybe even mid to high, you can get it anywhere from 50 to 100 bucks. If that was a Marvel book, I swear that would be like 500 to to $1,000. All right, guys, I gave you some of my secrets here today. I hope you enjoyed. I also will be recording 10 overvalued DC keys, which let me tell you, there's not many DC keys that are uh, overvalued, so that is a much harder video to make. Like I said, I got like 200 of these undervalued DC comics. If you like this, maybe I'll do a Marvel one too, although I gotta tell you, finding 10 undervalued Marvel books is gonna be tough. A lot of Marvel books are either appropriate or I think a little high. And then this will be really easy. I'll give you 10 overvalued Marvel books. I could probably give you 200 Marvel books that are overvalued. Let me know if you guys enjoyed the video, and as always guys, keep on hunting and collect what you love.